From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Bonita Hume in The Prisoner of Zenda. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes. It is your loyalty to Lux Flakes that makes it possible for us to bring you these programs week after week. And every time you buy Lux, I wish you'd remember this. Just a few flakes of gentle Lux make so many suds. Lux is the thrifty care for everything safe in water alone. The thrifty way to do dishes. So it's a smart idea to keep Lux in the three places you use it most. In the bathroom, for stockings, under things, and the pretty accessories that make you look so dainty. In the kitchen, for your dishes. And the laundry, for your dresses and sweaters. Tonight, Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Benita Hume, C. Aubrey Smith, Ralph... ...about the finest complexion care obtainable. I've seen Lux soap in the dressing rooms and homes of any number of stars. Actresses who could afford to spend almost any amount of money. Thanks for telling us that, Kathleen. But your job is to get good ideas for fan magazines. The 14 of them that appear every month have a combined circulation of 10 million. Each one prints about 10 articles which means that out of somewhere must arise 140 ideas every 30 days. Where do they come from? Well, take that recent article called... <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from this city of the fast fade-out, where actors know that their years of stardom are limited to usually not over five, where more than ten years of top billing is generally the stuff that cinematic dreams are made of and where Ronald Coleman, more popular than ever, after 15 years, is regarded as something of a miracle man. Of course, there's a reason for Mr. Coleman's enduring fame, and the reason is Mr. Coleman himself, a gentleman whose quiet charm matches his talent, and whose head has never expanded under the heat of the spotlight. Ronald Coleman was clerking in a London steamship office when the war broke out, during which he served with the Contemptibles, Lord Kitchener's first expeditionary force. He came to America after the armistice with high hopes of becoming an actor and with $37 in cash. He had only two lines in his first American play. But then, success followed success. One of his greatest he repeats tonight, Rudolph Rassendel in Anthony Hope's celebrated romance, The Prisoner of Zender. We're also joined by two other stalwarts from this film made by Selznick International Pictures, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. and C. Aubrey Smith. As Rupert of Hensau, Mr. Fairbanks proves he can parry a thrust with as much vigor as his famous sword-swinging father. The next picture in his brilliant career will be Rulers of the Sea for Paramount. Mr. Smith, one of the ablest character actors I've ever known, plays Colonel Zapt, and Benita Hume, who has starred both here and abroad, comes back to our footlights in the part of Princess Flavia. Ralph Forbes is heard as Michael, and Peter Wills is Fritz. Our curtain's rising now, and the Lux Radio Theater brings you... The Prisoner of Zender, starring Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., and Benita Hume. A lonely mountain stream somewhere in the woods of Middle Europe. To an aged oak near the edge of the stream is nailed a tattered placard which reads, Province of Zender, Fishing Preserve, Trespassing Forbidden by Order of His Majesty the King. Just below the sign, stretched out full length on the grassy bank, is a young Englishman. His head is pillowed on a fishing creel, and his rod lies unheeded by his side. He's deep in sleep, when two men in hunting costume come from the woods and stand over him. They gaze at him for a moment, and then turn to each other in astonishment. It's unbelievable. Look at him. There is a resemblance, isn't there? Resemblance? Look at the nose, the chin. Shave him and he'd be the king. He uh, isn't the king, is he? I mean, I didn't have that much to drink last night. Don't be a fool. The king's hunting over the ridge. Wake the man up. Say, he's there. You, you. Mm, uh? Wake up, wake up. Oh, your pardon, gentlemen. Good morning. Is anything the matter? May I ask your name, please? Well, since you've taken the first step in the acquaintance, gentlemen, suppose you give me a lead in the matter of names. This is Colonel Zapt, and I'm Fritz von Tarlenheim. We are both in the service of His Majesty the King. How do you do? I am Rudolf Rassendil, traveling from England. Not so long ago in the service of Her Majesty the Queen. Rassendil? 
Rassendil, by heaven, I knew there was some reason for it. Fritz, Zap, where are you? Here, Your Majesty. Where? Here, sir. Confound you, I thought I'd lost you. Why didn't you... No, who's this? He's by way of being a relative of yours, sir. A relative? It is something for which you cannot entirely blame me, Your Majesty. Oh, then who's to blame? If I may hazard a guess, Your Majesty, I would say that the blame might lie equally between your great-great-great-grandfather, Rudolph, and my great-great-great-grandmother, Amelia. What? Right by heaven, the man's a Rassendil from England, sire. <laughs> that accounts for the king's countenance. If I was unduly surprised, it's too early in the day for a man to see double, eh, Fritz? Well, where are you staying, cousin? What are your plans? I'm at the inn, sire, and I have no plans other than to... To fish, you must come to my coronation tomorrow. I'd give a thousand crowns for the sight of Brother Michael's face when he sees the pair of us. But of course, you don't know, my dear Brother Michael. I'm afraid, sire, I haven't that honor. Oh, we must arrange that he enjoy that honor, eh, Fritz? By the way, Rasendil, what name did they give you? The same as your majesty's. Ha, ha, ha. There shows they weren't ashamed of us, Rudolph. Thank you, sire. You must leave your quarters at once and come to my hunting lodge. Tonight, we'll dine you right royally. I'll see to that, sire. It's a night for celebration. Come on. <laughs> wine, Joseph. More wine. Yes, your majesty, at once. And now, cousin Rudolph, I propose another toast. Here, here. A toast. To our ancestor, that scandalous rogue, Rudolph II. Here, yeah, yeah. here. Ah, let's see, who'll be next? Your brother Michael, perhaps? Michael, why waste good wine? I'll tell you a secret about my brother Michael. He doesn't love me. No? No. Michael thinks the world's all wrong. He thinks he ought to be me and I ought to be he. Ah, let's forget about Michael. Let's think a toast to... to Cousin Flavia, soon to be my bride and queen. Here, here. It's a shame you can't meet the princess. At least I'm told it's a shame. I haven't seen her for years. She and I didn't get on very well then. Well, perhaps we shall now. I should certainly hope so, sire, if you're going to marry her. Now, they say she's too good for me. And probably is. You know what they say about me, don't you? I drink too much. <laughs> well, I imagine that you are well able to take care of yourself on that score, Your Majesty. You're right, cousin. I can take care of myself. The devil, take it wise, there's no more wine. Joseph! Joseph! Your Majesty. Your Majesty, please. Perhaps we rubbed his hands. Your Majesty. Your Majesty! Ah, it's no use, Fritz. Hello. Hey, that was quite an evening, wasn't it? Oh. What's the matter with the king? Joseph found him on the floor this morning. On the floor? Is he still asleep? Very much so. You didn't drink any of this last bottle, did you? No, not that I know of. Uh, I think you'd know if you had. Why? Was it... Was it drugged? It was. But how? Why? Who did it? Who else but Michael? Who else? Michael? His brother? Half-brother. Michael's mother wasn't exactly acceptable in court circles. But the, uh, the, the, the coronation? There isn't going to be a coronation. But this is fantastic, impossible. What's in Michael's mind? In Michael's mind? Only the throne and the Princess Flavia. And has he a chance? He has now. Michael is waiting in Strelsau now with Rupert of Hensau. Half the army already on his side, and half the people, too. And the coronation can't be postponed, huh? If he's not crowned today, he'll never be crowned. He must be there for the ceremony. He... Yes. Yes, that, that's all that would be necessary. The ceremony. Well, what's the matter? What are you staring at? Englishman, I'm much older than you. As a man grows old, he begins to believe in fate. Fate sent you here. Fate sends you now to Strelsau to be crowned king. What? That uh, sounds mad, doesn't it? But without your beard, I'd wager you could deceive your own brother. You must be out of your mind. It's a risk. Against a certainty. Uh, my dear Colonel, I came here on a fishing trip. I like to fish. 
I am a simple Englishman. I couldn't begin to act like a king, even if I tried. Oh, no. No, I'm afraid not, gentlemen. And Black Michael sits tonight on the throne, and the king lies in prison. Oh, his grave. His grave? Yes. I see. Well, I can't. After all, it would only be for today, wouldn't it? Tonight, you shall be safely across the border. King, for a day. And what would it mean if I fail? Your life. On mine, on Fritz's here. And all I'd have to do is shave. <laughs> Confound it, I'd become awfully fond of this beard. Then you'll do it? Yes, may heaven help the three of us. Frederick Arthur Michael, Duke of Strelsau, hereby assume the regency of the kingdom and order and proclaim a state of martial law. Very good, Dutch Arb. And now you sign, Your Highness. Now, the last detail. Remember, this proclamation is to be released 20 minutes after Hensau brings you word that the coronation ceremonies have been cancelled. Yes, Highness. We understand, Your Highness. At that time, our regent should have the civilian disorders well underway. And now, Highness. May I offer a congratulations? And I, <laughs> A shade premature, perhaps, but uh, thank you, gentlemen. Oh, Michael. Oh, uh, oh, come in, my dear. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. And now, gentlemen, you may go to your respective posts. The hour grows near. We go to serve our country and our future sovereign. Michael, what did he mean, our future sovereign? Is there more to this mad plan of yours? Well, as regent, the sovereign power will be mine. That's all he meant, Antoinette. Oh, Michael, Michael, my darling. I know this has been your dream. I've tried to believe in it. Above all else, I want you to have everything. Everything, that is, but power. Is that what you're trying to say? But what will it bring but the end of all our happiness? We shall be together, Antoinette. But where we belong, not outcasts. We could have each other. Isn't that enough? Darling, you must understand. Love is not enough. For any man. Oh, Michael. Have I failed you then so badly? I gave up my friends, my family. I know, I know, and I love you for it. I have no regrets. You've given me happiness such as few women know. I'd rather die than lose you. Good morning. I'm sorry to interrupt uh, <coughs> your majesty. There may come a time, Hensar, when your services will no longer excuse your impertinence. I was only training my tongue for the time when to call you highness... Would be impertinent, <laughs> Your Highness. Your witticisms do not amuse us, Hensau. Why aren't you in your place at the cathedral? Is there such a need, Your Highness, to hurry to the coronation of a king who won't be there to be crowned? Do we want to make it obvious that we knew he wasn't coming? We must be there. Oh, um, before I go, just uh, <laughs> one trifling matter. Detchard tells me that you've promised him promotion. Now, of course, rank and medals mean nothing to me. Can't raise money on them, Highness. Well, it will take the revenues of half the kingdom to settle your debts, Hensau. We'll discuss your finances after our success. Take your place in the cathedral. At once, Your Highness. Your dress looks lovely. Thank you. I called at your hotel this morning, but they, uh, they told me you were out. <laughs> Curiously enough, you were out, too. I'm glad you weren't lying to me. I, I don't like to have women lie to me. They don't usually do it, as a matter of fact. I, usually, I lie to them. You listening? I thought I heard His Highness order you to the cathedral. Ah, oh, and now you two are trying to put me in my place. Ah, oh, I like women who are arrogant. At first. It's always amusing to find that their arrogance is only a defense. But you don't need a defense with me. <laughs> I'm on your side. I, I think Michael's treating you wretchedly. And what's he getting at in this marriage of state? An insipid, flaxen-haired doll. Are you referring by any chance to the Princess Flavia? <laughs> Who else? What possible reason could there be for such a marriage? Well, how else can he get the crown? But he... he doesn't want the crown. He wants only to be regent. Oh, no, really, mademoiselle. I should have thought you knew your Michael better. You're mad. I... I don't believe it. Oh, it's shameful of him to keep you in the dark like this. You want to hold him? Make him jealous. Ah, oh, but you, you'll have to fall back on me for that. I'm the only man in the country who isn't afraid of Michael. Get out. Huh? Get out, please. Oh, of course. But, Your Highness... It's impossible, Your Highness. Recall the proclamation. Go at once to the cathedral. 
cancel all plans for the public demonstration in my favor. Go on, hurry. Yes, Your Highness. Anything wrong, Your Highness? Wrong? Oh, no, no, of course not, Hansau. Nothing, nothing at all, except that the king, the king has just arrived in Strenslau for the coronation. Receive thou this symbol of temporal power. This scepter wielded these many generations by all our chosen sovereigns, Sired of the ancient house of Elfberg. Zapped. What do I do? Take the scepter. Now, kneel down. Right. Receive thou now the crown of the kingdom, and understand what a glory of sanctity and honor and bravery it signifies. I, Rudolph, with justice and mercy to deal sovereignty, to guard with vigilance and honor the welfare of my peoples, from all enemies to defend them, and from the throne of my ancestors to bear faithful rule, all this do I swear. God save the king. God save the king. Zapt, what do I do now? Stand up. Stay where you are. The Princess Flavia must swear her allegiance. Oh, where is she? There, coming towards the throne. Oh, yes. But she's beautiful. Careful, careful. I, Flavia, do become thy vassal, swearing to serve thee in truth with life and limb until death findeth me. So help me God. Do I kiss her? Yes. Now through the church. To the carriage. With the princess? Yes. Good. This way. I thought everything went off very well, didn't you? For a coronation. What do you mean? Well, I mean, of course, the coronation should go well if the king puts in an appearance properly dressed, knowing his line. And sober. Yes, well, that's a nasty one. Don't you think you might overlook my past behavior and unbend a little? Don't the people want to see how well we get on together? Why should we deceive them? Oh. You know, I think the luckiest man in this world is the king of this country. Really? You always seem to prefer Paris and the Riviera to this country. Ah, but now I'm the crowned and anointed king. New leaf and all that. Uh, among other failings, I've rather neglected you, haven't I? Two picture postcards in three years. Oh, and all this time, Flavia, uh, may I call you Flavia? Well, <laughs> what a silly question. Yes, that was pretty silly, wasn't it? <laughs> But you see, I, I've been away for so long, and all this time you were changing into the loveliest girl in Europe. I must have changed since you saw me. I've been thinking the same thing about you. You really looked and acted like a king today. Oh, thank you. Something I confess few of us expected of you. Oh. Well, you see, when I looked at you, it seemed time for the king to settle down and try and live up to his future queen. <laughs> I think all this ceremony has gone to your head a little, cousin. You're right, it has. I don't know whether I'm on my head or my heels. I only know this is the most wonderful day of my life. And this ride with you... Well, aren't you overlooking something, cousin? What? Well, <laughs> you'd better salute the crowd. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> I'd forgotten I was king. <laughs> <laughs> And they're still cheering. They're with you, heart and soul. Oh, it's you they're cheering. I felt like doing it myself when I saw you. Why, we'd better go, you know. Your guests are waiting. Oh, not just yet. Please. I want to have you to myself for a moment. All day I've been on parade. Cheered at, waved at, stared at. Not a chance to say... Say what? <laughs> well, it is enough to make any man lose his head a bit. I am crowned king. I meet the loveliest, the most beautiful... Oh, <laughs> that isn't what you used to say. You used to call me that toe-headed little scarecrow. Terrible. I hope you slapped me. Yes, I did. And once I kicked you quite hard. Good. I deserved it. But I've reformed. 
almost beyond recognition. You seem an entirely different person. I can't understand. No, no, don't try. Just stand there and let me look at you. Flavia, I... Who's there? Oh, you. Well, Fritz? His Highness, Duke Michael, is waiting to pay his respects, sire. Well, let him wait. What? Furthermore, Fritz, your intrusion is decidedly uncalled for. Oh, but, sire, I... Yeah, that, that's enough, that's enough. Now, you may go. I may go, yes. Yes, sire. Oh, Rudolph, is it wise of you to make Michael angry? I'm the one who was interrupted. Why should he be angry? Besides, I'm the king. Well, he's probably furious. Bad-tempered fellow. Why worry about him? Oh, it's you I'm worried about. In that case, I can afford to be generous. I'll see him tomorrow. Rudolph, if you won't think of yourself, think of me. All my life, I've known what my future had to be, and I was resigned to it. Well, now, I needn't tell you how, how different it is. Different? I used to dread this day and the future, but now... Flavia, I've been unfair. I didn't mean... I only want you to realize how much your life means to... Uh, to your country. Only my country? Well, and to your friends. Friends? And to your cousin... And loving servant myself. Flavia. Good night. Don't go. But I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, Rudolph. Tomorrow. just heard the first act of The Prisoner of Zender, starring Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Benita Hume. During our brief intermission, we bring you another episode in the life of the Browning family. As the scene opens, we find Midge getting ready to go calling with her mother. She's frantically rummaging through her bureau drawers for something. Listen. Let's see. Here's one. No, that's too yellow. This one's too brown, that one's too pink. Oh, dear, what am I going to do? Why, Midge, aren't you ready yet? Oh, Mother, I've just popped a run in my stocking, and I can't find another whole one anywhere. Well, can't you match up any of those extra stockings you got? No, they're all different colors. Well, I guess you'll have to mend that run in the stocking you have on. Oh, Mother, I can't. It'll show. I'm sorry, dear, but it's the only thing you can do now. Oh, gosh, these nasty old runs. I get so sick of them. Well, maybe this will teach you to lux your stockings. You know you just can't rub your stockings with cake soap and expect them to last the way they ought to. I know. I should have used Lux Flakes. If you would only remember to, dear. Lux will cut down on your runs and save you a lot of embarrassing moments. Stocking runs are embarrassing, not to mention expensive. And really, it's easy to cut down on them if you'll stick to Lux Flakes. Lux saves elasticity, so your stockings can give under strain instead of breaking into runs so often. Don't rub stockings with cake soap. And don't use soaps with harmful alkali. These weaken elasticity and encourage runs. Stick to gentle Lux flakes and lux your stockings every night. You'll find they wear longer and fit better that way. Mr. DeMille. Act Two of The Prisoner of Zender. Starring Ronald Coleman as Rudolph, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. as Rupert, and Benita Hume as Flavia. With C. Aubrey Smith playing Zapp, Ralph Forbes as Michael, and Peter Wills as Fritz. Tomorrow has come, and Rudolf Rassendil, the imposter king, waits only for the return of the real king before leaving for England. But something has gone wrong. Colonel Zaptu went to Zender to bring back the king, found the lodge deserted, Joseph murdered, and the king gone. Now Zapp faces Rudolf in the palace at Strelsau. Gone? What do you mean, gone? The king's not there. They've taken him away. But Michael's been in Strelsau all day. Still that, is. That devil Hansel hasn't. Well, then that settles it. They know everything by now. Yes, they know everything. But they can't speak. They can't denounce us without denouncing themselves. That still won't keep them from murdering the king. With a, you on the throne, they won't dare. Me on the throne. No, it's too much to ask. Nobody could carry on this masquerade. I've tried to help you all I can, but I'm not a fool. Yes, I suppose you're right. It's just that... You see, Rudolph is my king. I I have a feeling about my king, about the crown. I feel about it the way another man would feel about his children, 
or the woman he loved. He'd hate to leave her to her fate without making a fight. What fate? Whose fate? Can you ask that when the king is kidnapped? Perhaps murdered? Oh, you know whom I mean. Oh, the Princess Flavia. With the king dead, Michael as regent will declare her the queen, and after that, of course, he'll marry her. She'd never do that. She couldn't. Flavia is a princess of the royal house. She'd have no choice. You can't let that happen to her. Can you? No. Then you must hold the throne, Rudolph, until we find the king. So, Rupert, you've been here in stress law. Why haven't you reported to me? Oh, now, would I disobey orders, Your Highness? I went to the lodge at Zender, and I haven't been out of Zender Forest since. But the king hasn't been out of Strelsau since. And if you went to the lodge, what did you find there? I found the king in the cellar, well and truly drugged. Still there? <laughs> what happened next must have been Zapp's idea. Tarlenheim couldn't have thought of it. What was Zapp's idea? Passing another man off as the king under your very nose, Highness. What? Mm, odd, a man not knowing his own brother. But I assure you they might be twins. Are you trying to tell me the man I saw crowned is an imposter? <laughs> Not your type of fiction, I see, Highness. Too incredible. But things like that do happen. You know, I once knew twin sisters that were... Oh, well, that's another story. I'm beginning to understand. He hasn't been behaving at all like my brother. Oh, naturally not, since he isn't. But if this is true, why hasn't the king been heard from? Where is he? He's in a woodcutter's cabin. You've abducted him. <laughs> well, it's an old medieval custom, abducting kings. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert, only you could carry out such a coup. What have you done with him? Uh, well, first, Highness, there's one thing we haven't discussed. Now, why do people abduct kings? Just for fun, Highness? Isn't there usually the little matter of the, uh, the king's ransom? You can be the first man in this kingdom, after the king. <laughs> oh, thanks. But how about a little something now on account? More well, 10,000. Oh, that's a poor price for a king. And a crown. 20. That's final. Mm, well, it's, it's too cheap. But I do find him a bit of a nuisance, always whining about being chained up. Did you hurt him? Only slightly, but the cabin is very damp, Highness. I was afraid he might develop pneumonia. And let the Englishman reign all his life? You realize, don't you, we couldn't expose him. That hadn't occurred to me. But if the Englishman dies first and is buried in the cathedral as the king... Yes. Yes, I think that's the solution, Enzo. Oh, sire. There are moments in your presence when I feel myself an amateur. Any news, Colonel? No. It's perfectly clear we shall never find the king by watching Michael. Gentlemen, the king is dressed for the ball. Your Majesty. By the way, Colonel, how is my kingdom? Well, it seems from these secret police reports that the people are not entirely satisfied with the way you're handling things. No? I thought I was doing fairly well for a novice. So you are, lad. So you are. But listen to this. The king is much criticized for taking no steps about his marriage to the Princess Flavia. Mm, I'm sorry to disappoint the people. And the Princess Flavia. The princess's best friend told me very confidentially that the princess is becoming increasingly offended by your delay in proposing marriage. That settles it. You must speak tonight. I'll not propose tonight or any other night. I refuse to make a fool of the princess. Or myself. Flavia, you promised to go out on the terrace with me. Is that a command, sir? It's a command. Please. You're very cool this evening. Have I offended you? You've said nothing to offend me, sir. <laughs> what you really mean is I've said nothing. Is that it? Well, I, I'm sure you have excellent reasons, sir. Flavia, please try to believe me. I may be the sort of man who, who'd take advantage of any number of people, even a whole country, but I could never willingly do anything to hurt you. I don't understand. Then try to believe this without understanding. I love you. Oh, is it true? Or is it only because you must? I love you more than life or truth or honor. Oh, Rudolph, I've so wanted you to say that. 
tell me, how is it that I love you now when I never even liked you before? Never before? You seem so different. Well, perhaps I am different. Yes. That's what's so wonderful. I wanted you to be different from the Rudolph I knew, the Rudolph I didn't love, and you are. And yet, you aren't. But if I were different, if I were not the king... Why do you say that? Could you love me if I were not the king? Rudolph, does a woman who marries without love look on a man as I look on you? Flavia, I am not. Your Majesty! A thousand pardons, sire. His Eminence, the Cardinal, is waiting to take his leave. Of Something course. Something wrong? Something wrong, Colonel Zapp? Nothing, Your Highness. It's always my unpleasant task to be the reminder of duty. Mm, who is it? Rudolph, I must see you. Oh, Fritz, come in. Look at this. This letter, it's for you. Can't it wait till morning? But look at the name on the envelope. Let's see. Deliver instantly, Rudolph Razendil, Esquire. Razendil? Can't be a tailor's bill from home. What does it say? If Mr. Razendil desires to know the whereabouts of the king, let him come tonight at two o'clock to the summer house behind the wall on the boulevard Elfberg. He must be alone. He must take you for a fool. A trick of Michael's, obviously. If you hesitate, consult Captain von Talenheim. Ask him what woman to do most to prevent Michael from marrying the Princess Flavia and therefore most to prevent his coming king. And ask if her name begins with A. A? Antoinette de Mauba, Frenchwoman, mad in love with Michael, of course. How far is the Boulevard Elfberg? Are you going? I am. At two o'clock tonight. Duke's orders. So I thought. Three men are coming here to kill you. Where's the king? Before I tell you, your word. An English gentleman's word. No harm must come to Michael. Have I your word? Yes, as much as I can give it, if you tell the truth. They're moving the king tonight from a hut in the forest to Michael's castle near Zender. That's what I wanted to know. Wait. If the castle is attacked, the king will be killed instantly and no trace of his body will be found. <laughs> nice chap, Michael. Do you want my help or don't you? I want your help. But how can we rescue the king? Leave that to me. You must have his friends near at hand, at his hunting lodge, on some pretext or other, or boar hunting, anything. I'll send you word when to strike. Now go, and quickly. And you? If Michael finds out what I've done, you and I shall not meet again. Ah. Good luck in everything. And to you, with her. They've come. That you soon. Mr. Rappendall! Mr. Rathendall, pardon this untimely interruption. I only ask a word with you. It's Rupert of Hensow. Don't trust him. You don't answer to that name, sire. <laughs> I have an offer for your majesty. We can talk with the door between us, Count Rupert. As you please. I'm true while I offer peace terms. 50,000 pounds in English notes and safe conduct to the frontier. Ah, that seems handsome. Come out, then. I have a good horse for you and the money ready. Just a minute while I think that over. Stand there, out of the line of fire. But what are you going to do? Sorry, but I'll have to use your tea table as a shield. Do you mind? But how can you Listen, possibly... As they start in the door, I'll start out. Oh, they'll kill you. Now stand back. Gentlemen, I accept your offer, relying on your honor. If you'll open the door... It's locked. Oh, but it isn't. Come in, gentlemen. Get him! Ah! Ah! There you go. Get behind him. Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> understand you, Rudolph. Last night you made me feel that every hour away from me was wasted. But now you're going boar hunting. That's a different thing, I suppose. My darling, did you dream that I was leaving you to go hunting? Well, then you're not going... Well, I'm not going hunting. That is not just for boar. Well, then what are you going... Oh, Rudolph, it's Michael. Oh, it's nothing. It seems he's hatched a little plot at Zender. Against you? Oh, darling, you mustn't go. Oh. Shall I tell them I can't go because we have an engagement to go riding? But I don't understand. And I can't explain just yet. 
But believe me when I say there are reasons why I must go. I'm sorry. You see, I've never been in love before. That's better. You'll write to me. I'll send you my heart every day. And you won't let Michael hurt you? No, sweetheart. Or keep you from me? No, sweetheart. Nor anyone else? No. Sweetheart. I must go, darling. You stay here. Your back turned. Don't look at me. If I see your eyes, I might forget to be a king. You'll come back soon. Shan't a man come back to the loveliest lady in all the wide world? A thousand Michaels couldn't keep me from you. But if I shouldn't... No, 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 don't. Don't turn. You will never, never forget me. Never. And you will be a brave queen and do your part. My life would be empty. My heart dead. But you would do your part. Goodbye, Flavia. Rudolph! Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain falls on Act Two of The Prisoner of Zender, starring Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Benita Hume. During this short intermission, we'll hear from our guest. But first, here's a thought for the ladies. When it comes to washing dishes, there are two ways to keep your hands nice looking. You can hire a maid to do your dishes, and that runs into money, doesn't it? Or you can do your dishes yourself with Lux Flakes, and that will cost you almost nothing. It's amazing how soft and smooth your hands stay with Lux. There's no harmful alkali, absolutely nothing in gentle Lux flakes to dry the oils in your skin and make your hands rough and red. Lux is kind to your hands and kind to your pocketbook because a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty, you know. Here's Mr. DeMille and our guest. Tonight's guest never knew the, the royalty of our play because they exist only in fiction. But he's met the real-life royalty of practically every kingdom in Europe. He's Colonel Ivar N. Herning, who served in the armies of Sweden and Finland, who was military attaché in Austria and Germany, and who has some 20 decorations for his military and diplomatic achievements. Because of this knowledge, Selznick International Pictures called him in to steer them right in the filming of tonight's play. And we've called him in to tell us how he did it. It was a rather unique job, Mr. DeMille. You see, everything in the picture had to appear absolutely authentic. But since the story is about a kingdom that never existed, everything had to be unauthentic. Uniforms, court ceremonies, the flags, the medals, the military proceedings, all had to be made up to avoid treading on some nation's toes. So we found ourselves in the peculiar position of trying to be right by being wrong. Uh -huh. Will you tell us what royalty actually thinks of the very formal etiquette which surrounds the throne? Kings and queens, Mr. DeMille, don't like formality in their private lives any more than do ordinary people. But in their public lives, they are forced to maintain traditions and the strictest kind of etiquette for the sake of the high office they hold. Will you illustrate your point, Colonel? Well, I believe the sternest advocate of upholding the formalities I ever knew was the late Queen Victoria of Sweden. Once as officer of the guard at the Summer Palace, I was ordered to see her immediately. I reported, wearing full dress uniform and heavy saber. I had misjudged the situation, however, for this was to be a family affair, not a formal public one. The queen was surrounded by her grandchildren. We are going to play with the children, she commanded, whereupon one of the princes informed me that I was to be an elephant and the queen was to be a tiger. The grandmother queen got down on her hands and knees. So did I. Everything went along very well until the prince said, that the elephant was to eat the tiger. <laughs> Instantly, his grandmother remembered that she was a queen and I was a soldier. For me to eat her was a little too much. She simply said, the play is ended. <laughs> Proving that royalty like elephants never forgets. Well, I knew one princess who often forgot her high station to remember humanity. 
She was a former Swedish crown princess, Margaret of Connaught. There was a time, for instance, when she was walking down a lonely road near her private palace. A blind peasant woman, who didn't know her identity, stopped and asked the princess to lead her home. The home was a broken-down hut. When they got there, the blind woman asked the princess to read her the Bible, and later asked if she would mind coming back to read to her again. Every day of that summer, the crown princess of Sweden visited that hut, bringing gifts and reading to one of Sweden's most miserable subjects, who never knew who her benefactress was. And that, Mr. Emil, is real nobility. Mm. You've shown us the human side of the throne, Carl. Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., and Benita Hume in The Prisoner of Zender with C. Aubrey Smith and Ralph Forbes. Armed with the knowledge that the king is held prisoner in Michael's castle, Rudolph and the king's loyal followers have gone to the hunting lodge nearby to wait their chance to save him. Now in the dead of night, Rupert of Hensau has come to the lodge with a request to see Rudolph in private. Come in, Hensau. The audience is granted. Your Majesty, I bring you your brother's humble greetings and his wish that you enjoy good boar hunting here in Zender. And his respects, of course, to Colonel Zapt and Captain Frintz, your two principal boars. I am surprised, Hensau, and deeply hurt to hear that you willingly gave up your pistol at the door. Looks as though you didn't believe we trusted you. <laughs> I did it for my own protection, Your Majesty, not yours. In the best English plays, a gentleman never attacks an unarmed opponent. Well, what price the crown today? The last offer from my brother was 50,000 pounds. Do I perhaps hear 52,000? Well, the Duke offers you more than I would. I simply said, why not hang the play actor and uh, save the money? Indeed. And Michael? He doubles the offer. 100,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I told Michael you'd refuse. But the fact is, between ourselves, Michael does not understand a gentleman. No, but we do, don't we? <laughs> oh, Rassenthal, you're a man after my own heart. Frankly, you and I are the only two people worthwhile saving in this whole affair, now aren't we? <laughs> now, here is my plan for us. Disregarding Michael? No, oh, Michael's such a bore. Now, listen. Attack the castle boldly. Uh-huh, go on. Arrange the time with me. I have such confidence in you, of course. Black Michael will fall. The king, well, um... Uh... You don't want to find him. You won't. That's provided for. And your friends? Well, if, uh, if they fall too, then only you and I are left to know the truth. Understand? <laughs> I, Rupert Hensau, and you, king of the realm. I see. But aren't you being a little unfair to Michael? Oh, perhaps a little, but uh, I can't put up with his jealousy. Jealousy? Mm-hmm. You've seen it. Oh, yes, yes, Antoinette. So the Duke gets in your way. Hmm? Well, that's hardly a fair way of putting it, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> I get in his way. Surely she doesn't prefer the Duke. Yes, the silly creature. <laughs> then you're doing all this for love. How romantic. Well, love and, um, and your Majesty's gratitude throughout your long and happy reign. And then, of course, you, you might make over to me Michael's castle and estates. Shall we shake hands on it? <laughs> Zap, Fritz! Come in and listen to this. I would also promise play actor to leave your golden-haired goddess alone until I wanted her. Why, you... Now, don't get excited, please. You see, I left only my gun outside. I still have this. Touch me with that dagger and you'll be full of holes before you reach the road. It's almost worth the chance. But I imagine we'll meet again, play actor. Perhaps under conditions more favorable to me. Yes, I'm sure that's the only way we'll ever meet. Of course. Good night. Good night. <laughs> I wish we'd get some word. This waiting is intolerable. Why don't we attempt the rescue and be done with it, either Michael or ourselves? It would be a pleasure, Fritz, but what would it gain us? Do you think Michael would fall and let the king live? Besides, what justification could I, the king, have for attacking my dear brother, Brother Michael? Are we to do nothing, then? We are to do nothing, stupid. And don't be in such haste to end your life, young man. If you will forgive me, sir, your impatience seems on occasion to equal my own. Oh, it's different with me. I've spent my life, and it's been a long one, in the service of the throne. I can do no more than die in its service. Now, or a few years later, what difference will it make? It makes a great difference, Colonel. You've never seen England in the spring. Ah, 
There's a little stream I'd like to show you, too, where the trout... Aye, lad, it'll be a pity if we never get the chance to go there. God grant that you at least may see your own country again. I'm not sure it could ever be the same again. I know, lad, I know. Come in. A man is here who insists he has a personal message for His Majesty. Have you searched him thoroughly? Certainly, sir. Send him in. In here. I'm Colonel Zapp. What is it you want? I have a message for His Majesty from Madame Antoinette de Maubin. De Maubin? Well, what is it? I am to lower the drawbridge at two hours past midnight. But the king will be killed at the first alarm. Yes, Majesty. She says before the bridge goes down, one of your men must swim the moat and go to the first room on the left of the corridor. The king is imprisoned there. Yes. That man alone must hold off the guards from murder until the others cross the bridge and get below. Ah. Tell Madame... We shall be on the shore at two, waiting for her signal. Then I will swim the moat. The others will wait until you lower the bridge. Now go. I think I should swim the moat, Rudolph. Right, lad. Can't afford losing both our kings. One king you'll lose tonight. If anything should happen to the king and not to me, your game is up anyway. Oh, no, I swim the moat, Fritz, not you. But if we lose you both, what will become of those of us who are left? They will serve Queen Flavia. And I would to God I could be one of them. Rapstein! Here, Henso. This castle's gloomy as a vault. Where are you? Here. The relief guard was ten minutes early tonight, Henso. Why? <laughs> the Duke's as nervous as a kitten. Must be expecting old Zap to bob up out of the moat in a diving helmet. <laughs> well, getting late. I'll have a last look at the doors and the drawbridge before I turn in. Good night. Good night, Enzo. Who's there? Who's there, I say? Berlonson. Lorengram, was that you? All right, my friend. I see you. Come out of that shadow. I've got you covered. Come out. Good evening. Well, <laughs> if it isn't the play actor, with his tin sword, too. Well, that won't do you much good now. Pity. When did you give up knives for pistols, Hensar? Oh, I carry both now. Extra precautions, you know. They tell me you fancy yourself with the saber. Why not finish me off in more sporting fashion? <laughs> Oh, you might as well face it, Resendal. I'm not a gentleman. And what a tragedy for both of us that you are one. For both of us? Yes, for if you weren't, it would suit me to keep you alive. Oh, how it would suit me. <laughs> ah, if I were only some king's twin. Ah, well, I'm sorry to have to kill you. I really am sorry. I could be very grateful for my life just now. And you once mentioned something about Michael's castle and estate. You think you can buy your life with a few old stones and two provinces of mulberry trees? Half of my kingdom. For a cigarette. Of course. You might as well. There are matches on the table. Thanks. Ah! Don't try and pick up that gun, Hensau. Your sword will have to do this time. Touche, Rassendel. <laughs> I can't get used to fighting with furniture. <laughs> Where did you learn it? Oh, it all goes with the old school tie. Well, if I must fight like a gentleman... I don't let's be gentlemen. Well, then, now for your last fencing lesson. On guard! Well counted. But your garden court is too high. By the way, when... What did you expect to gain by this visit? The king's life, if possible. Oh, not really. You know, your guard is much too high. I could finish you right now. Not really? Huh. Exit the play act. Exit delayed. Sorry to disappoint you, old man. Why don't you let me kill you quietly? Why quietly? You English are such a stubborn lot. Well, England expects that every man, you know. <laughs> well, then, why don't you do it? I have to chase you all over the castle? I'll take my fencing lesson in my own way. Stand your ground and fight. I'm just prolonging this as long as I can. <laughs> You're not afraid to die, Rassendel. That's not British, you know. It's just my nature. Keeping you away from the king until the drawbridge is down. What? Shall we rest now? What did you say? About what? The drawbridge. Oh, that. Uh, 
There he goes. Now, hence all, I'll stand my ground. By you! On guard! Don't wait too long, Hensal. Captain and his men should be here at any moment. I'll just have time to finish you off. There they are! What's the matter? Are we resting again? Sorry. I could have done it in another moment. But it's a little too warm for me here now. Au revoir, play actor! Good night. You all right? You're wounded. Oh, it's nothing. The king? He's safe. We've got him. And Black Michael, too. That's good. I'm just a little tired. You don't mind if I, I just have some sleep, do you? Rudolph. Fritz, quick! He's painted. <laughs> Sure you're feeling well enough to travel, Rudolph? Oh, never better. How's the king? He's weak. Still some fever. But we'll soon have him well and back in Strelsau. That's good. Well, my work's done. I can go now. I'll see England again after all, Zapt. Wait. Before you leave, Her Highness wishes to see you. Does she know everything? Everything. What did she say? Nothing. She wants to see you. Rudolph. They've told you, Flavia? Yes. Oh, you're hurt. They didn't tell me that. My only hurt's the thought of the pain I must have caused you. Flavia, from the first moment I saw you in the cathedral, I've loved you with all my heart and soul. But forgive me. It would have made no difference if I'd known. It was always you, never the king. I meant to tell you. I tried to on the night of the ball. I know. What are we to do now, Rudolph? Oh, I'm going away tonight. Oh, no, no, you can't. I must, I must, before people have seen me. Flavia, come with me. Oh, if I only could. If only... Why not? I love you. And I love you. Oh, Rudolph, help me. Is love the only thing? If love were all, you would have left the king to die. Honor binds a woman too, Rudolph. And my honor lies in keeping faith with my country and my house. I don't know why God has let me love you, but I know I must stay. God shows his purposes to such as you. Goodbye, my beloved. Your heart will always be in my heart. And the touch of your lips on mine. Your heart will always be in my heart and the touch of your lips on mine. Goodbye, Flavia. down the curtain on the last act of The Prisoner of Zender, starring Ronald Coleman, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Benita Hume. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain call. But first, may I say something to the mothers in our audience, particularly mothers with small babies. I don't have to tell you how sensitive a baby's skin is. You know that it takes very little to irritate it. But here's something you may not know. When you wash baby's clothes with soaps containing harmful alkali you run the risk of chafing his tender skin. And you certainly want to avoid that, don't you? Then listen to what Mrs. G.E. Knapp of Cheverly, Maryland, who is the mother of triplets, says. My triplets had such sensitive skins that only the mildest soap could be used on anything they wore. I knew from experience that Lux was safe, so I used it for the baby sweaters, dresses, diapers, all their things, and they haven't been troubled with rash. Yes, Lux is safe for baby's things. It has no harmful alkali. You don't risk irritating baby's tender skin. And Lux won't fade colors or spoil the fit of baby's clothes either. It's safe for everything safe in water alone. So keep the thrifty large size box of Lux Flakes in the house, won't you? And use it for everything baby wears. And for the many nice things you wear, too. 
Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone with our stars. Rudolph and Flavia said goodbye a moment ago. Suppose we reunite them now as Ronald Coleman and Benita Hume, accompanied by Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. To ease the minds of the listeners who may be wondering who played the part of the king and who sounded so much like Ronald Coleman, I'm sure it's quite all right to tell them now that the part was played by Ronald Coleman. I could add that you played your dual role to the hilt, Ronnie. Yes, you could, but please don't. <laughs> Incidentally, Mr. DeMille, I understand you once acted in Zender, too. I hesitate to use the word act, Benita. However, I appeared in Zender the first time I ever played before an audience. I also tackled the dual role, which was very easy at the time because uh, my voice was changing. <laughs> <laughs> and where was this first DeMille epic produced CD? Well, in Derlings Hall at Pompton, New Jersey. There was one disadvantage to Derlings Hall, however. It was located over a grocery store. Oh, I'd walk up a flight of stairs any time to see you act, Mr. DeMille. That's very kind, Benita, but the point is that every night the theater was open, the grocery store stayed open too, doing a land office business in very ripe tomatoes. <laughs> Proving just one of the advantages of acting on the air. <laughs> is it true, C.B., that when Zender first hit Broadway, it exerted a tremendous influence in the field of matrimony? I know of no play before or since, Ronnie, that has inspired so many gentlemen to pop the question and so many ladies to answer yes. <laughs> well, if that's true, Ronnie, think of the havoc you may have wrought tonight. And that's a good, as good a hint as any, Doug, for me to say good night. My thanks, Mr. DeMille, for a most enjoyable evening. Our microphone's always at your service, Mr. Coleman. Good night. Good night, Doug. Thank you, Benita. Our stars and play for next Monday night are announced presently by Mr. DeMille. The cast of The Prisoner of Zender included Ian McLaren as the Cardinal, Paula Winslow as Antoinette, Eric Snowden as Joseph, Lou Merrill as Detchard, and Frank Nelson as Kraftstein. Ronald Coleman's next picture is Paramount's The Light That Failed. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. and C. Aubrey Smith are seen shortly in The Sun Never Sets, made by Universal Studio, through whose courtesy Mr. Smith appeared tonight. He is also in the new RKO film, Five Came Back. Louis Silvers directed music at 20th Century Fox Studio for young Mr. Lincoln. Be sure to listen to the new Lux Daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. The makers of Lux Flakes bring you this enthralling story about the love and problems of a young, attractive woman doctor every afternoon, Monday through Friday. Look in your newspapers for the time and station. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Now, Mr. DeMille. Before I tell you about next week's program, may I remind you that beginning this coming Thursday, June 8th, the people of our 48 states are observing Flag Week. A good time for good Americans to show their colors. And we hope that you'll join our audience next Monday to hear a most unusual play written by the author of Magnificent Obsession, it's the story of a woman who attaches herself to a middle-class family, teaching them to overcome disappointments and difficulties through her simple philosophy that victory is always built on defeat. Our play is called White Banners, and in this inspiring drama, you'll hear the same two stars who contributed so much to the motion picture, Faye Bainter and Jackie Cooper, and starring with them, Lewis Stone. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Faye Bainter, Louis Stone, and Jackie Cooper in White Banners. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Join us again a week from tonight. Be part of the large audience that gathers from coast to coast you hear Hollywood's most popular stars in your favorite plays of stage and screen. Your announcer has been Melville Rowe. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>